Amen. Mark chapter 12. I want you to turn your Bible there. I've been preaching on the new commandments. The new covenant. The new the new way. Again, leaving the old flesh out of it because you've your flesh understand this. Your flesh, your physical body, is already condemned. The Bible actually says, ye are dead in trespasses and sins. And that goes to every single body sitting in this room or looking at us online. Every one of us have already condemned the flesh... And it is dead by trespasses and sins. It is condemned. This is why we're fighting off death right now. But at some point, death is going to win. And it's going to rot and corrupt. It's going to take over and corrupt the rest of this body. And it's going to be gone. There's nothing left. So we're talking about a new covenant. Not the old one that applies to the old body, but the new one that applies to the new man. We're learning about the inner man in Sunday school. And whether you're able to attend physically, or I want you to watch it online, whether you watch it live or after it's posted, I want you to watch those lessons. Because you can play a religious game and die and go to hell. People do it all the time. I've seen people do it all the time. And I am not concerned about what the flesh does. I'm concerned about what your spirit does. Amen. Mark chapter 12. This message is about sinners. And it is for sinners. And if you're here today and you're a sinner then I want you to listen to the Word of God. Sinners come to church. Sinners sit in church pews. Sinners read the Bible. Sinners preach. Sinners preach. And they have to preach even against their own sinful nature. Or it ain't right. Why do we come to church? Why are we here? Why do we need one another to help us get through this life? Have you considered the possibility of you trying to get by all by yourself? Have you ever said to yourself, I don't need anybody, I don't want anybody, I'm going to do this on my own. I'm just going to I want everybody to leave me alone. I'm going to try to get by this all on my own. It doesn't work. People have tried it. And it doesn't work. It's Mark chapter 12, verse 28. One of the scribes came, having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well. Asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And like we sang this morning, when you realize that Christ loves those who are in error, and He is willing to, To give of himself for you and do for you what you do not deserve to have done for you. When you realize that, then loving God becomes pretty easy. Can I hear somebody say amen? And the second is like, namely this. Thou shalt, in fact, say this out loud with me. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Now, last Sunday I preached on loving yourself. And it means loving your own soul. You you don't want your soul to be condemned 
to burn in the lake of fire for all of eternity. I don't want my soul condemned. And if I don't want my soul condemned, then I love others enough to not want their soul condemned. I love you. I love you enough to tell you what God did for you, what God is willing to put up with. Of course, listen, I preached a message here a while, I don't remember when it was, but it said, of course we're sinners. Of course we are. If we weren't, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't need to be here. But we are here in God's house, gathered together as sinners who are in need of a Savior. Heavenly Father, I ask you, God, to help me preach this message. Help me to, to follow your commandment, your word. And Lord, I'm not interested in what I have to say today. I'm only interested, Father, in what you will say to me and to my people. Father, when I consider what you have done for me and the help that you have given me and the forbearance and long-suffering that you have given to me, when I really sit and think about it, God, I don't deserve it. I never did, I never have, and I never will. And Father, I understand that God, you did not make me above any of these people. You made me the same as these people. Sinners who beg for forgiveness. Beg for forgiveness from heaven. Beg for forgiveness from others. And even beg forgiveness of themselves for the things that they've done. Father, let this message be a message for sinners. For those who truly want salvation. Those who truly desire a change in life. Different way to walk. Having the burden of sins now taken off of them. And they bear it no longer. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would help us then. Love each and every one that is here, each and every one that's in our families, each and every one that is in our homes, each and every one that people that we know, people that we work with, people that we see every day, help us to love them the way you love us. As you were willing to take the burden of our transgressions on yourself and not consider yourself as you were willing to do that for me. Help me then, Father, be willing to do that for somebody else who needs it. Because, Father, you've forgiven me, I am all about forgiveness. Help us to love one another, help us to love your word, and to love you, and help us to love one another the way you love us, is what we ask, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen. There are several ways the Bible talks about the new law, the new commandments. If, you, um, if you've studied some of the Hebrew roots, nonsense, those who follow, the, they call themselves messianic, they follow a, a Hebraic ideology, and really what that is, it's veiled law-keeping. It's, it's the idea that we can only please God by doing our very best to keep the Old Testament laws. They do not understand, they have no concept whatsoever of what that really implies. Because the Bible makes it clear. 
If you say that I am going to honor God by doing exactly what he says in the Old Testament and not going against that, then you're then obligated to keep every single one of those laws. And if you break one of them, you have broken every one of them. They do not understand that. They think that God gets pleased by us being as best as we possibly can. Therefore, God will give us blessings. That is not how life really works. That is not how Christianity works. It is not the doctrine of the New Testament. It is a doctrine of, of bondage because it requires strict adherence to these rules that God gave us that none of us have ever kept in our lives. None of us have. Not I and not you. The only one who has ever kept those perfectly to bring upon himself the blessings that were given in the Old Covenant was, of course, Jesus Christ and Him alone. Somebody say Amen. It's only Jesus Christ. So therefore, He then, by God's grace and by God's mercy, initiates a different law to live by. It's not the law that says you have to do everything right. It's the law that says we trust the one who already has. So James calls it, James 1.25, Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. And when he said the law of liberty, again, the Hebraic people want to say, see, that's the Old Testament law. If you keep the Old Testament law, there's liberty. That's true, but you don't keep the Old Testament law. And you never have and you never will. Never will. So the law of liberty is, even though you have broke God's commandments, even though you've done that, God still loves you and forgives you. Wipes away all your sins. James 2.12 So speak ye as, and so do as they that shall be judged by, he says it again, the law of liberty. And understand what he's saying here. When I stand before God and I'm judged of God, in my old life, I would have been judged by how well I kept the Ten Commandments. Since I didn't keep those, my flesh is already condemned. And it does not matter. Church, listen to your preacher. It does not matter which one you didn't keep. It does not matter. That you didn't do this, but well, you know, I did this every now and then, but that's not as bad as someone who did this. There is no such thing in God's eyes. You violate the law, you break the law, you break the law, period, the end. So I'm not going to be judged by how I kept the old covenant. I am judged, but he said, I shall be judged by the law of liberty. I am judged by God for loving God. And loving others. And then doing for them what God has done for me. Let me show you what I mean by that. Uh, I'm going to skip some of this. Here's, here's Hebrews. Talks about the same law. It calls it a better hope. Hebrews 7.19. Hebrews 7.22. Calls it a better testament. Hebrews 8.6. He's a mediator of a better covenant. And it's established upon better promises. In Hebrews eleven sixteen, it is a better country that we're going to inherit. Because if you keep the Old Testament law, then you get the Old Testament promised land. Which I've never been to the promised land, but it's not some place I really look forward to going to. I'd rather go back to Alaska than go to the Middle East. Amen? I mean, if you like desert and oil and Arabs, fine. Okay? But that's just not my cup of tea. I don't really care about inheriting... The old land of promise. I care about a better place to go to when I die and leave this world. And I'm telling you, this world is getting so bad and so rotten and so filthy. I want out. I want that better place. Somebody say amen. I want it. So, I mean, that's how, that's how God is putting this. It's a, it's a better law. It's a law of liberty. It's a better hope, a better testament, a better promise. A better mediator instead of Moses who failed God. It's Jesus who never failed God. Did you often wonder why Moses was not allowed to go into the promised land? He's the mediator that broke even the, his own law. 
And God said, Moses, you can't go. And the, the purpose of that is to show us that law-keeping does not get us to the promised land. All it does is show you, listen to me, all it does is show you what you missed out on. You know what I think God's going to do to every sinner? Every sinner that stands before God in judgment, and God is going to have to send them to the lake of fire. I think God says, see this? See heaven? This is what you would have had. But you're not getting that. You're getting a lake of fire and darkness. That's what God did to Moses. Moses, see that land? Isn't that pretty? You're not going. You're going to see it and never make it. Okay? Galatians chapter 6. Here's what I want to preach to you this morning. Do you love one another? Okay, I, I'm not asking you to say amen. I'm asking you to ask yourself, do you love other people? Do you love sinners? Do you love them? So Galatians chapter 6, I want you to turn in your Bible there. That was what I just gave you was the build up to the message. This is the message. Galatians 6. Revival sounds like Bible pages turning. Like that. Unless you're a swiper. Right? You got your phone or your tablet Bible out. Swipe. Maybe they could make a Bible app where it goes swoosh. When you go from chapter to chapter. Swoosh. Ephesians chapter 6. Read that. Verse, read the first three verses. Read it to yourself for a second. All right. Now look up here. Raise your hand if you've ever been overtaken in a fault. That was everybody here. Everybody. I've said this before. If you go to an AA meeting, what are you? Oh, I'm just here as an observer. If you go to a, an NA meeting, Narcotics Anonymous, what are you? You're an addict. If you go to church, what are you? You are a man overtaken in a fault. And everybody is guilty in the eyes of God. Amen? Brethren. Now, I don't expect lost people to understand this. Because lost people don't have God dwelling in them, helping them do what's really hard to do. I've watched, I've watched news stories where somebody's family member was murdered. And then the victim's family would come out and they would say we decided to forgive the person who murdered our daughter or murdered our son or we, we decided to forgive them and we hope and pray that they find the help they need do you understand how hard that is it not only should be done it can be done Okay, And this, this message is for everybody and to everybody. Number one, for those who have sinned. This is the place to be. For those 
who know someone who has sinned, this is the place for us to be. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such and one in the spirit of what? Meekness. And here's why. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. The purpose, in my opinion, of having a church to go to, even if it's you're going online, the purpose of that is so that, number one, I can help bear your burdens. That's why I'm here. So I can help you in your life. This is a hospital. We're all the patients who need the hospital. Hospitals don't throw people out because they're sick. They bring them in because in the hospital, that's where the healing is. Remember that. Next time you go off and do something stupid. The first thing the devil will say to you is, you can't go to church ever again. You can't do that. You don't belong there. Why? They'll throw you out. Now, there's a process for putting people out of a church. It really is. It's in the Bible. And it only applies to those who refuse to repent. And there are people who have done awful things, just refused to repent. They don't have no place and no purpose here in God's house. See, we don't throw out people who sin. We throw out people who won't repent. Because the purpose of this, if someone is restored who has done something wrong, they're restored by people who realize that next time it will be them who need the restoration. Because it will be the next. I get, listen, I guarantee you, who you won't forgive, you'll be the next one in line who will need that forgiveness. Am I right? So verse 2, bear ye one another's burdens. And so fulfill, look at this, the law of Christ, there it is. See, he calls it, back here, he calls it a better hope, better mediator, better promise, better country. He calls it the perfect law of liberty. I mean, it's called a lot of things in the New Testament. But here, it's called the law of Christ. He's not telling you, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't kill. You've already done that. He's telling you to bear the burdens of those who've committed adultery, who've stolen, who've lied, who's cheated, who's coveted, who's put up idols in their heart, who's not honored God. That's the law of Christ. So fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something... When he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Can I get amen? amen? You, this is the first church of you're a nobody. Maybe we ought to change your church sign. First church of nobody. Come to Bethel where you will be nothing. Why not? Because it's not about me, and it ain't about you. It is about Jesus Christ. So I asked the question a while ago, man, if, if a man be overtaken in a fault, and I ask you to raise your hand, I'm going to go up one notch, start getting nervous. If that fault that you did was really bad, 
I mean, really bad. I stole a candy bar one time. I don't mind admitting that. It wasn't yesterday. Okay? It was a long, long time ago. Back when they were only 50 cents. But if you have done something really bad that you don't tell anybody, now I want you to raise your hand. Same, same people. Same hands. Same people. You see what I'm saying? It is the church's responsibility to not bayonet our wounded. You know what that means? They're on the battlefield. They've been wounded by the enemy. They're laying there suffering. You, who are a soldier on their team, say, Oh, you poor guy. <laughs> now we don't have to deal with you. We don't do that. We bear their burdens. Turn to Psalm 38. I'll preach this message if it's just for one person, but I can tell that it's not. It's not just for one person. Psalm 38, verse 1. <clears throat> o Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Was God angry? You bet he was. Oh, you better believe he was. Was your mama ever angry at you? Trish, did mom ever get ticked off at you? You better come down here and repent right now. And I'm calling her. Yep. You never been whipped until you've been Judy Hoggard whipped. Verse 2. For thine arrows stick fast in me, and thy hand presseth me sword. You know what that is? This is you doing something wrong, and God's doing that to you. And then he's doing this to you. He's putting it on you. Why is God doing that? Somebody tell me why God's doing that. Make you feel guilty. He's not going to let you get away with it. You cannot sin in God's eye and think that it's okay. He will not, he will not put up with that from you. He's your father. Amen. Hey. Verse 3, there's no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger. Neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. Who's been, who's felt that before? Ugh, man, I hate that. Look at verse 4. For mine iniquities are gone over my head. And now look at the rest of that verse. As an heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. I can't carry that. If you try to do things on your own, you'll crumble. Even Jesus needed help carrying the cross. It was too heavy for him, wasn't it? My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I'll go mourning all the day long. 
for my loins are filled with a loathsome disease. You know what that disease is? Sin. Sin. And I know there's all different kinds of sins. But I think we understand that sins in the loins are very prominent nowadays. Very prominent. My loins are filled with a loathsome disease and there's no soundness in my flesh. That describes the sinner who is under the hand of an angry father. He is not going to let you get away with it. So now turn to Exodus. <clears throat> I believe in conspiracy theories. Who believes in conspiracy theories? God, I'm surrounded by them. Who believes it was not Oswald? It was not Oswald. But I, I, I try to be grounded in my conspiracy theories. Biblically grounded. Now everybody listen to me. We just rescued four kids. I've been in this church a long time. I don't think we have ever done anything as good together as a church than that. I don't think we've ever done anything that good. I believe that there are more out there that God wants to use us to save. And I don't mean just little orphan kids in Kenya. I believe there are people all over the world that God wants to use this little dinky church to save, to rescue. For some reason, I've had people just calling me this week, writing me this week, telling me how important this church is to them. And none of them go here as far as being in this building is concerned. They're all there. They've told me that this church rescued them. It saved them. It drew them out. There was a guy that confessed publicly this week online that he struggles with marijuana and he follows this church and he reached out to this church for help with that who does that who comes out and admits publicly I smoke dope and I and I'm trying I know God gets me every time I do it and I hate it and I want help who does that and you know I, I talk to the man you know what he told me? He's got a local church and a local pastor, Wayne. And when I said, have you told them? And he said, no, nobody in my local church knows. My pastor doesn't know. Only this church does. Why? Why would God use this church to help somebody who's struggling with dope when he couldn't even reach out to his own church. I think there's something special about this church. Or I wouldn't be here. I think maybe the guy understands that when he sees us, he sees sinners 
like he is that wants forgiveness and he wants salvation he wants deliverance I will take those people all day long so here's your conspiracy Exodus chapter 1 verse 7 all you got to understand is that first part and the children of Israel were fruitful all you got to understand stop right there the children of Israel were what that means that God was manifesting the fruit of the Spirit in them. That's what that means to us. And I'm here to tell you, any person or any family, any marriage or any church where God is blessing, you need to understand how dangerous that is to Satan. You have no concept the danger and the threat that you represent. Because here's somebody that the devil has locked in his bondage of sin. And all of a sudden, they come across this guy on YouTube talking about UFOs and Bigfoot and the New World Order and DNA and he's Bethel Church and the King James Bible and he starts listening, and he gets saved, and the devil says, I'll to get, get back here! I'll destroy you for that! In fact, I'll destroy that church for that! Read this. The children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty. And the land was filled with them! We have agents operating in Chicago, Nashville, Salt Lake City, Washington, D.C., Dallas, Texas, Kenya. We've got them scattered everywhere. We got a guy, we got a secret agent coming in from Australia this week. Don't let me forget to pick him up from the airport. We have people scattered out all over the country, all over the world that love the Bible. And they're dangerous. So verse 8 now there arose a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it came to pass that when there falleth out, listen to this, when there falleth out any war, is there a war coming? When there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us and so get them up out of the land. Trish, the devil hates you. Because you're fighting on the other team. So, Trish, this is why every rotten thing that's ever happened to you and because of you happened. It was to try to stop you from praying. And it's not just Trish, by the way. So verse 11, here's, here was his, here's what he did, guys. Listen to your Bible now. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their what? Burdens. What did I just say out of Galatians? Bear ye one another's what? And so fulfill the law of Christ. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramses. Now, here's, I'm going to throw this in. You guys have helped build the devil's kingdom. Remember the stuff that you did? Remember where you sent money to? Remember how you... I won't even get into stuff you did. But you helped him out. Verse 12. Listen to here. Listen to your Bible. But the more they were afflicted, or the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. And all their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. That's why you sinned. That's why 
you fell in to that stupid stuff you fell into. It was the devil's way of trying to prevent you from serving God. Psalm 55, 22. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and He shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Turn to Matthew chapter 11. I'm going to stop here. Am I done? Yep. Worked out pretty good. I'm done preaching. I'm out of verses. Matthew 11. Turn there, and I'm going to, we're going to have an altar prayer. How many of you feel like praying? Oh, come on. Am I going to be the only one? Matthew 11. Verse 28. Let's end with this. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light when you carry sins they are too heavy for you and you can't do it now listen it's also the same when you carry unforgiveness. It's too heavy for you. And you'll bow down under it. So the yoke, when you're yoked with Christ, where He goes, you go. Where He dwells, you dwell. What He does, you do. Those of you who did something really bad and stupid, if God forgave you, raise your hand. That's church. That's this church. If Christ forgives, then we forgive others. Give the Lord a hand, Milton. It's not easy, but we bear one another's burdens here. If one of us sins, we're all going to bear that. Amen? Okay? Now, if you're not up for that, and that's not you, I understand. But I'm the pastor. This is what I said we're going to do, and we're going to do it. Amen? So, I'm going to ask you all to come in. Number one, pray for yourself. Consider yourself also likewise. Number two, pray for others. Okay? See, I'm looking at this room. I'm figuring you folks out. Some of you look as guilty as a June day is long. You want me to, name, you want me to call your name out? But wouldn't you like to be forgiven?